Greetings. <laughs> this is Moo 61A. And with us today is Marcus Hobbs. Uh, somebody told me I would know him better as Marcus Satellite. I'm not sure that's true, <laughs> but I like the background. Marcus. Uh, thank you, Johnny. Uh, thanks so much. Here, Moo. Go. Yes. Moo 61. Let's go. Kick it off. <laughs> Um, good to be here, everyone. Uh, Johnny, thanks so much for creating this space, uh, bringing us all together, and thanks for um, giving me some time to, to share uh, some really cool advances in microtonal uh, software synthesis. Um, here, let me share my screen. Uh, can you all see my screen now? Yep. Yay. All right. Um, it's hard for me to see you all, so give me a shout if you uh, have any questions. Uh, you know, feel free to jump in in the middle. We can make this a little bit interactive. We do have quite a bit of material to get through, so I'm uh, just going to get down to it. So today we're going to talk about um, interactive uh, pitch design. So uh, I'm going to show you tools that I made. I'm going to focus mostly on the my latest Mac uh, audio plugin tool, uh, and uh, it lets you uh, sculpt uh, palettes of pitches, and so you can interactively find emotional spaces that you want uh, to create your music in. So that's uh, that's what we're going to get into. Uh, first, uh, I love starting with the, the mood definition of microtonality, and Johnny, this really resonates with me uh, big time. So all music is microtonal music cross-culturally. 12 tonical equal temperament is in itself a microtonal scale, only it enjoys exorbitant attention and, and hegemic, hegemonic power. So we focus on the other tuning arrangements. I love that because um, 12 ET is a legit scale. It's awesome, but uh, it's well-trodden to say the least. And so... I find myself just exploring everything else. Um, this is my agenda for today. I'll just give you guys, um, you know, spend a few minutes about me, just give you context on why I build these tools and how I want to work with you and collaborate with you all. Uh, and then I'm going to highlight uh, where this can fit into a creative process. Everyone, you know, has different creative processes. I'll show you the advantages of uh, using tools like this. Uh, I'm not going to spend too much time on the iOS tools, Wilsonic and Audio Kit Synth One. I'll just mention them, share links to them. Um, but, uh, but they did lead to what I'm going to spend most of the time on, which is uh, um, a Mac OS uh, audio plugin. It's a, uh, uh, qu quite the thing. Uh, I'll get into that in a second. And then uh, I'll spend the vast majority of the time going through each of the tunings that this uh, plugin supports. And uh, um, I'll, I'll do audio demos, you know, show you how they work in the, the, the host that I'm using. Uh, and finally, um, the software is now available. It's public uh, beta at the website. And I'll sh I've sh shared links in the MU uh, software channel in the Discord uh, server. Uh, so they're there. I'll, I'll reshare them and I'll share. Uh, I've already shared these slides as well. So feel free to check, out, check that out. Uh, the slides link to a tremendous number of resources. So uh, everything I'm about to share with you, you have access to um, through these slides. And then I'll save some time for Q&A. But like I said, feel free along the way to uh, stop and ask. Uh, and just questions. let me point, some people haven't joined Discord for the second year. We had um, not as much activity as we might have expected. So, okay. um, you know, if anybody wants to still join Discord, contact Vitolt afterwards, you know, after today, and uh, we can get you an invitation. But it's something that it's sort of on its own right now. But it's a great place, of course, to leave materials. Awesome. Um, I'm struggling uh, to find the chat with uh, this, so I'll just um, share those resources uh, in the chat when I'm done. Uh, all right, let's get into it. So um, just about me, um, uh, software developer uh, slash musician slash composer slash music theorist. Uh, maybe I do probably too many things, so I don't do each one of those very well, but <laughs> I have a unique uh, combination that lets me uh, at, at least build tools um, and that I think are important and I can see for myself uh, uh, how important they are. I have an article um, on Zen, Zen Harmonicon just explaining my relationship with, with Irv Wilson, uh, how I came to know him, you know, the kinds of things I learned with him, how I met Stephen, et cetera. So uh, I don't want to take too much time to go over that here, but you're welcome to uh, read that if you want to understand more about um, how we connected. And then, you know, how am I plugged into the Microtona community? I'm, I'm here with you, you all. Uh, other folks that um, I spend time with, uh, Irv, before he passed. Uh, Steven is my, my main guy. Uh, me and Steven spend lots of time together. 
and uh, Craig Grady. Uh, I would say Craig's a pretty formative uh, a guy for me. Um, he hosts Oliver's paper uh, on this website, Anaphoria, which I've linked to as well. So uh, all of his uh, Irv's papers, and I mean all, literally all, are there. So you, you know, these are some examples of them. He, he was big on drafting and handwriting stuff. So um, I'll touch on some of these papers, the most important ones, the ones I think are the most musically useful. Uh, but again, a great resource for everyone uh, if you want to do get some uh, uh, ideas on uh, tuning systems. And then Gary David, um, John Chalmers, Chuck Jonke, Trumi, and then Johnny, of course, you all. Uh, so let's keep going. Create a process. So who, who would want a usable sonic? I haven't even shown you what it is yet. But uh, basically, uh, anyone who wants to create their own scale designs by interactively exploring uh, space, emotional space. So if that's you, then this is the tool for you. You can also play like pre-baked stuff. You don't have to explore if you don't want, but that's what sets it apart from uh, some other tuning software. Um, Stephen uh, Taylor, Gary David, myself put together a documentary uh, many years ago. It's linked to here called Surfing the Sonic Sky. Uh, we, we made this documentary because we ourselves struggled to answer the question of like, why is microtonality so cool? <laughs> why, why do we like it so much? Uh, Gary uh, David's quite the uh, epistemologist. So uh, this document do documentary was sort of our way of just trying to uh, put perspective around why we you know, were in love with uh, music and microtonality. In it, there's a, um, a metaphor that uh, we came up with. I, I think it was probably Gary or Stephen who actually came up with it. Uh, but if you imagine uh, in the world of music, uh, a tower, uh, there's four floors in the tower. Uh, each floor, uh, the folks who hang out on that floor have like different, uh, they pay attention to different things. They have different interests and uh, you can overlap. You can go, they're none, none of them are mutually exclusive. You can go to all four floors if you want. I think most, I, I would imagine folks on this call actually uh, go back and forth between all these floors. So imagine the first floor as people who are mostly interested in just listening to music. They don't care how it's made. They don't, they don't, they're not musicians themselves, maybe. Maybe they don't even have theories of how to do it. They just love it. They love listening to it. So that would be you know, uh, the most basic floor. Now, the floor above that uh, would be the musicians themselves. Uh, these people not only love listening to music, they love performing it. They care about things like instruments and uh, songs and you know how, how to perform the songs and you know the emotions that you feel when you play those songs uh, so that's sort of their 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 attention that's that's where they spend the most time one floor above that would be you know composers so composers are working at a different level they're they're thinking about uh, you know the structure of the song itself well what's the nature of the orchestra here like what what instruments are these musicians playing am I you know doing a Concert, am I a rock band, am I a jazz band, am I a EDM artist? What what am I? So the the instruments themselves as part of the creative process, the composition or songwriting itself is part of the uh, the creative process, and the tuning itself. And this is why I love uh, the microtonal definition that we just reviewed. So many folks on level three just assume that twelve et is all there is. They don't even think about. They don't realize that the choice of the scale is as important of a creative choice as the choice of the instruments or the choice of the composition. And, uh, and that's, I think, where this, this team comes in. That's certainly where I come in. Uh, I, I want that to be a first-class citizen in uh, the creative process when one goes about uh, creating music. And finally, at the top floor, uh, scale designers themselves. Uh, so folks like folks on this level, they create entire systems of tunings. Uh, like the, the there's there's no they they imagine structures uh, of tunings, and uh, that's actually what most of this demo will be. I'll actually show you many different kinds of systems uh, of tuning. And uh, in my case, I'm I'm really hyping the whole interactive part. So I, I like I like systems of tunings where there are parameters that you can explore and move around. They're not just static and fixed. They, you can settle on one and go make music with it, but when you're done with that, it's time to move on and uh, move some parameters around. So anyways, uh, I hope that uh, metaphor is very useful for you all. I feel like everyone here probably hangs out on each one of those four floors, uh, but I feel like this team here especially uh, is very interested in, in that fourth level. Um, all right, so I will I'll pause there because I'm gonna change subjects. Uh, any questions, any, any thoughts, reactions to that before we keep going?
I have a thought. It's a, just a fleeting one. When you talk about how everybody is uh, and the world is so, you know, uh, overexposed to 12 tone equal temperament, it makes me think of Coca Cola. You know, something that was thought of as innocuous, something that's thought of as almost healthy when you're younger. And I think it's maybe an interesting uh, metaphor for your 12 to equal temperament. Cause a tooth decay, too. <laughs> All right, let's keep going. So I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but uh, I first uh, started creating these interactive tools uh, on the iOS platform. They're still available on the App Store. Well, Sonic is the app on the top that you see uh, in it. Uh, had, had many of these scales and tuning systems I'm gonna show you on the Mac uh, platform. But the nice thing about iOS is it's interactive, right? It's a touch screen. Uh, so that was the, that's a game changer. Uh, and so uh, I made all the parameters to these tunings, like uh, you just drag your finger around, you can spam the app. You don't even have to know what you're doing. You can get cool sounds out of it. Uh, Johnny's uh, grandkid, is a fan. He's one of my number one fans. Um, finally, uh, the app below is called Audio Kit Synth One. So, well, Sonic has a lousy synth engine. It's just sine waves. It's terrible. It's not an expressive musical instrument. It's it's designed to let you design scales, and that's it. Um, Audio Kit Synth One is actually a really nice software synthesizer. It sounds really good. It's got a billion presets uh, made by dozens of uh, sound designers. So, it's a legit like pro synth. And uh, it's tightly coupled with Wilsonic. So any tuning that you have in Wilsonic, you can fast switch into Audio Kits uh, Synth One, and it'll it'll be saved in your tuning presets there. So the two together, you can make some really cool music. Um, over a million people have downloaded these apps, uh, 20k five star reviews. So I'm really really proud of this. It was a big big accomplishment. But I'm not going to put any more time into that. Why? Why? What, what's wrong with it? The big problem there is um, these are standalone applications. What that means is they can't be hosted in a, a DAW, a digital audio workstation. You can't really sequence anything. You can't, uh, you know, that creative workflow that folks are used to on, on a professional, you know, like a laptop, it's not available on the iOS platform. So I made this album, Heavenly Bodies, with those apps. But the way I did it is essentially like the Beatles, right? Like just a, I used the DAW as a four track recorder and I would do live performances of the synthesizers and record them. And then I would edit those, but I was just editing audio recordings. So very hard to make intentional composition uh, with tools like that. So I knew uh, that, you know, th this was, it was worth putting this time in, but it was time to move on and, and get GoPro. And that brings us to um, a recent development. So, uh, don't quote me on the actual date, but you know, I'd say 2020 ish. Um, uh, the MIDI spec was amended to include um, something they call MTS ESP, uh, basically polyphonic microtonality. And uh, a group of uh, developers uh, called Odd Sound um, they leveraged that, that spec to uh, basically create a set of tools that um, would, would let you tune up all of the software synthesizers in a DAW all at the same time uh, to a master uh, uh, tuning table. And so there's this notion of an MTS ESP master and clients. And the master is the guy with the tuning table and everyone else in the session uh, is tuned up immediately in real time to it. So uh, what I've done since then is written Wilsonic as an MTS ESP master. So now you can work in a DAW, do intentional composition, you know, record your MIDI, edit your MIDI, play back and reproduce, you know, what you, what you perform uh, with MIDI. So um, anyways, that, that is the major advance and that's, that's what I'm going to spend the most time on here. Um, the Odd Sound site, oops, sorry, this is my website. Um, where's the Odd Sound site? This is the Odd Sound site. Um, many soft, Okay, it's not quite plug and play. There's a little bit of setup you got to do. So, um, so this this website will be an important resource for you. Um, there are many software synthesizers. These are some that are built to just work. They just work. If you load them up in your DAW and you have a master, they'll they'll be tuned up. And they're listed here, and this list is growing. Now, if, if your favorite synths are not on this list, that's fine. Now, there's there's other things you can do. 
to uh, tune up your synth. And uh, on this website is a, uh, a lot of documentation on exactly how you do that. It's very specific for your favorite sequencer. I happen to like Ableton Live. Uh, Logic works really well. GarageBand works well. Um, still struggling with Digital Performer. Steven, sorry. Um, <laughs> it's, it's every sequencer is different. And so some have better support than others. But in Ableton, they will show you for any software synthesizer exactly what you need to do to um, uh, to get your master to work with your 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 synth. So be sure to check that out. And it has all kinds of uh, how to deal with errors, all that kind of crap. All right, we're going to start getting into the good stuff. Uh, I kind of already explained this, but uh, the way this works is you you have a desktop computer, you have a host. This is the master, and these are the the clients, the, the software synthesizer. So talk over that all right let's get into it so i'm going to show you um, my, my master plugin in ableton law uh, ableton live we're going to go over these tunings um, i'm going to show you each one of these so uh let's dive in uh, before we get started any questions feeling good all right just just one Quick question: Can uh, with the with the tuning software, can you have more than twelve notes per octave, or uh, or is it only? Oh, I'm going to show you. <laughs> Let's okay. just jump into it. Okay, <laughs> you're, you're speaking the answer my is language. yes. <laughs> okay, Speak, speaking my language now. Okay, here. Let's. So this is able to learn. Um, so um, are folks are folks here familiar with like? Dawes and you know, Ableton, I'm a, you guys probably know it better than me, right? Okay, so uh, Will Sonic is, uh, so in, Ableton Live is a little bit different. They have a timeline view, that's this, that's what most people see in most Dawes, but they also have what they call a session view. Not every Daw has this, so if this is not familiar to you, how this works is each column is an instrument. Uh, it could be a MIDI instrument, it could be an audio instrument, it could just be audio clips, whatever, um, and each row, is uh, the MIDI or the audio that you want to play uh, for that instrument? And so, by clicking, I'm going to I'm going to make some noise. So brace yourself. <laughs> so I have you all can hear that, right? Yes. Okay. So I have three instruments, uh, not counting Will Sonic. So Will Sonic is is this. I have uh, a plugin called Piano Tech. This this is one of those synths that just works uh, with masters you don't have to do anything crazy uh serum uh same serum just works uh i have surge surge is an example of an instrument that doesn't just work you have to use a special max uh plugin in front of it to uh the max plugins listens to the master and then uh tunes up uh the synth so many synths are need this little extra step and that's all covered in that um odd sound documentation that i i shared so when you start playing around with this, if uh, if it if you, if it's not working, just go look at that manual for your um, for your sequencer, and it will tell you you know if you need to do extra steps like this or not to get your favorite software synth to work. All right, so Surge, Serum, Piano Tech, and then Wasonic. Now Wasonic comes with a very simple synth. Uh, it's not intended to be an expressive uh, instrument, but it is. It's a, a ref. Oops, can't hear it. You guys hear anything? No. Are you no play? No. Are you no play? Oh, I see. Yeah. Whoops, sorry. Too loud. All right. Um, this is a two note per octave it's scale. Super, super low sounds. There you go. That's good. Okay. That's a little too loud. Hold on. It's good for us. Yeah. Okay, so well, Sonic has a simple synth, and the intention here is just to make sure that your other awesome synths are tuned up correctly. So think of it as like a tuning fork or something. Um, uh, it's, it's just to make sure everything's working properly. So I will um, turn that down. So um, going back to my slides, the very first thing I'm going to show you is what I call Wilson's Garden. Uh, I think Stephen might have been the one that maybe Craig. Uh, a, a, a metaphor you hear uh, when talking about Irv is uh, is a garden. He was really into agriculture, actually, uh, bread, corn, uh, and other things. And uh, you know, he he was he encompassed like so many 
say it's like tuning systems and designs like uh he was just so all-inclusive we just kind of tended to think of him as like a gardener <laughs> and all these tuning systems are in his garden so anyway that's where that uh metaphor comes from and so it has a lot of uh curated scales uh by Irv himself craig stephen uh, others jose gary myself i think one thing i've done is curated uh a profound number of scales by playing around with all the parameters. So even though I've, I didn't design some of these tuning systems, I explored the hell out of them and I've uh, shared a bunch of my favorites as well. So um, I think these sound delightful. So this is the curated list, it's kind of big, uh, but the best ones are at the top. And then, you know, I attributed, uh, you know, like if you see Grady S7 pentatonic, um, yeah, Craig, Craig provided that one for me. Stevens in here, blah de blah. Anyway, there's a million. I also included archetypal scales, like just harmonic series. So we'll just go through some of those real quick. Uh, this is the harmonic series uh, carried out to two places. This is the subharmonic series. This is uh, the two combined. Then you get into uh, triads and the harmonic art. And then the two together. So you get the idea. Anyways, there's a million of them. They're just presets, so you don't even have to. And you can uh, automate like the like uh, switching between different uh, presets. Yeah, uh, Vito's very excited about that. As yeah, in real time. <laughs> yeah, so, real time. So what was I doing? Uh, so these clips actually have automation in them. So uh, every single parameter in Wilsonic could be automated in your DAW. I'm going to say that again. Every single parameter <laughs> can be automated in the DAW. Uh, that is why I did this. That, this is what you can't do on iOS. And so, for example, uh, you, you see maybe that... Maybe we can say what's automation for, for those who don't know. That would oh, be, be uh, great. that's a great idea. So in a DAW, one of, the, one of the most powerful things about the DAW is that parameters such things, for everything, things like volume, pan, uh, 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 EQ, uh, you know, parameters of your software synthesizers, all of these show up in uh, parameter lists like this, and um, they can all be recorded. and um, And you can edit that recording, and then you can play it back. Um, and this is a really important, really really important part of the creative process. Um, so uh, these are the parameters I've chosen to automate for this demo. So I have Wilsonic designs, and so this is what lets you go through each. Oops, sorry, this is not this guy's not playing. There we go. So as I move, come on, man. Oops, sorry. Designs. As I move through this, I'm I'm moving through the app itself. This guy is uh, got some fat fingering going on. So you're getting progressions of scales. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I I'm, progressions of tunings. Yeah. I'm navigating through my app through automation in the DAW right here. So right. I've captured all that automation in these clips and that's what you see uh, as I'm, you know, as I was playing things like this. Okay, so that's Wilson's Garden created um, tunings and then uh, I'll give you the demo of the automation. Now, one more thing that's super cool, go back to my slides, uh, next one. Uh, we're going to get into moments of symmetry, uh, but uh, first I wanted to show this little thing in the keyboard. You notice I have uh, in Wilsonic uh, a keyboard at the bottom, and, and the keys, you can see how they're mapped to the MIDI keyboard. So 60 is middle C on your MIDI uh, keyboard. So it's, you know these are the MIDI note numbers. You have 128 of them, but I color the keys based on pitch. Now, everything I'm showing you today is uh, based on the octave. It doesn't have to be. Uh, all of my math works for any kind of period, doesn't have to be an octave, but the octave is so powerful <laughs> and so useful. I'm just going to show you octave-based tunings today. But uh, so I'm, it, it's colored 
where uh, red is middle C, it's 12 o'clock. And then as you go through the octave back around the 12, uh, it goes through the color wheel. Uh, and I, I label each key based on uh, the ratio uh, that's there. So it's four over four is the one, obviously. And then four over seven, three over five, four over six, blah, 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 blah. What are these cute little dots at the bottom? What, what, what is that? So that, that is um, uh, the proportional triads is subcontrary triads. So proportional triads are actually a, a Fibonacci triplet. Um, they're, and, and there's, I have a lot of uh, resources here. I don't know if you guys want to get into the tuning of it, but, but, but well, Sonic will show you the proportional triads and subcontrary triads in real time as you explore scales. So for example, if I go to moments of symmetry and I move this generator around right here, this generator has these proportional triads and subcontrary triads. So modern laptops are so powerful that I can actually explore whatever scale you're doing instantaneously in real time and search for uh, triads with properties like that, which is really, really cool. Now, Marcus, um, explain a little bit about proportional triads, just the, the arithmetic of them and of the subcontrary triads as well. Sure. So this was um, like original little treatise of it. Um, so Irv created a lot of systems that optimize for some and difference tones. So uh, he, this is a really powerful psychoacoustic uh, perception that, yeah. that, that we have. So yeah. when you hear two frequencies, um, uh, you not only hear each of those two frequencies, you hear you, you sense the sum of those two frequencies as well, and also the difference of those frequencies. It's kind of like seeing an outline or positive and negative space is kind of how I like to think about it. So the sum triplet is, you know, like let's say, let's say one frequency is A and the other frequency is B. Well, then you, you also hear A plus B. Um, but if you take A plus B and divide it by two, which is really just revoicing it to be in between those two, that's what's called a proportional triad. So um, you hear the sum and difference tones. Uh, uh, when you play a triad like that, the sum and difference tones also lie on those three notes. So it's a very powerful reinforcing effect. The subcontrary triad, um, I don't have a, a paper on it right now, but um, is uh, what's called the harmonic mean. Uh, think of this as like a minor triad. Uh, and so this is the math for it, but it's uh, it's essentially the average of the inverses. I guess that's the best way to say it. Um, so, um, you know, and like the inverse of a major triad would be a minor, minor triad. So I like to think of it as a minor triad. And again, so this is the math for it here. And, and again, they just show up interactively. So throughout this whole demo, as we start playing around, you'll see the keyword flash with those things. And if you see those things, you can play them. And let me just uh, play, I have a, I have a clip. Here, I'll... So I'm playing these proportional trads that you see here on the keyboard. That, that, that's what you're hearing. So I'm sorry you can't actually interactively see them when I play them in the sequencer, but... And then... Hold on, I don't think that that didn't play right. I think I made a mistake on this one. No. Let's play this. Okay, that's not different. Oh, here we go. This is what I wanted. Here we go. So you can see it playing on the bottom here. You can see which. Uh... So those were the proportional triads of that tuning. And then here's the subcontrary ones.
Um, but yeah, pretty cool, huh? Those, those share those, those share a different tone, don't they? Um, those last four that you played, it, it sounded like it, huh? Yeah. I'm sorry. This is it. Um, that timbre might be too complex to um, to actually hear those different sounds, but anyways, love that. All right, let's keep going. Um, so as we we're going to go through the rest of the tunings, and as we do that, many of them will have these kinds of triads, so you, you get that for free. Um, okay, so let's go to moments of symmetry. Moments of symmetry um, slides. So what is a moment of symmetry? Um, this is a, um, a scheme for creating scales where you take an interval that's on, within the octave and you repeat it. And um, you, if, it, if, if your re repeated interval goes past the octave, you, you, you know, fold it back onto the octave. So uh, I'm not gonna read all this text, uh, but um, you repeat that process until you only have two size intervals, some kind of a large interval and some kind of a small interval. This this is a very handy technique if you have an interval that you really like. Like I like nine elevens, I like five fours, I like fifteens. Uh, you you can create a scale uh, based on that interval, but you'll you'll get other intervals with it. So let me show you. This is my favorite. Is um here. Sorry, that's pretty. Okay, so this is an example of the octave. Um, uh, at this first level, I haven't actually selected a generator yet. So all I have is the octave. So now I'm going to subdivide it by taking an interval. And now I have, I have two notes per octave. I have a, a small interval, this one, and I have a large one. Um, so if I take that interval and go out another interval, now I have three notes per octave. and so forth when I get to the fourth one here. Now, what happens when I go to five? I, I didn't quite, I'm, I'm almost to the octave. Where, um, there we go, I love this. I like that beating, it's really fun. Um, and so forth and so on. So here's nine notes per octave. And uh, you were asking earlier if you could do more than, uh, 12 notes per octave, and yes, you can. And here, I'll just uh, play that. I'll do a different one. You can, you can go way, way out. You know, let's just do something small. So anyways, you have uh, got the whole um, spectrum here. Um, as you move the generator through the octave, you build all these scales. Um, so yeah, it's a pretty vast space to explore. Uh, many uh, ancient scales can also be approximated uh, with uh, moments of symmetry too. So uh, metaslendro, uh, paylogs, et cetera. Um, so that's most of symmetry. 
Okay. And I've always thought of it, by the way, Marcus, as a tiling algorithm. Like if you were tiling a floor, a strip of the floor, and you wanted to use one size tile as your measurement, you can just, you can create a pattern like that with a large tile and a small tile and get all the way across the floor with it. Mm. I always thought of it like hopscotch on a sidewalk, like yeah. <laughs> where you're trying not, you know, step on a crack, break your mother's back. Like, you know, yeah, right. <laughs> like choose an interval where you never hit the sidewalk crack, right? So, yes, right. Okay. Let's keep going. All those moments of symmetry, we already covered uh, proportional triads. Um, so Irv uh, was really big on um, uh, deriving uh, ancient scales. So uh, there's a paper, Irv, I'm sorry, Craig hosts on his website. This is just one page out of it, um, where Irv you, takes, um, I want to say this is a, a chain of thirds. Um, I could be wrong on that. There might be more than one generating uh, thing there. But uh, it's all, he has a whole bunch of schemes for doing this that are all on here. So, yeah, anyways, it's deep in here. So you have all these uh, here. So this is the, the master scale, but subsets in the scale make all these uh, regional. I think my favorite one is this one. Love that one. Um, so yeah, uh, not a lot. I, I don't want to uh, go through each and every one of these, but you get the idea. There's really, really nice, beautiful uh, seven tone scales in this uh, system. All right, let's keep going. Ah, uh, now we get to the good stuff. Uh, combination product sets. Uh, so Irv has a pretty canonical paper called D'Alessandro Like a Hurricane. And in here, um, he describes uh, a bunch of uh, constant structures based on Pascal's triangle. So <clears throat> when I was in school, uh, I have a math degree, they you know spent a little bit of time on Pascal's triangle, but uh, I had no idea that it had musical applications. Uh, most of what they tell you in school is about uh, binomial coefficients or you know, like how to, how to use it for combinatorics and permutations. But um, Irv actually, you know, let's keep going to the good stuff. Um, Irv actually um, created uh, planar representations of the geometry so that, that they could be mapped to keyboards. So um, this is an example of uh, four choose two and um, or four choose one, four choose three. Um, so what does that mean? So if you choose a set of harmonics that you like, say one, three, five, seven, like that, that's what's here in this diagram. If that's your master set, so there's four harmonics. So when I say four choose one, what do I mean? I mean, how many different ways can I choose those four harmonics? How, how many different ways can I choose four of the four harmonics? Here, I actually have that here. So the answer is four. There's only four ways to choose four harmonics. Um, however, what if I were to say to you, how many different ways can you choose two, two of those four harmonics at a time? You multiply them. So for example, uh, I, I, the five and the seven, the one and the five, the three and the seven, the one and the three, the one and the seven, the three and the five, that, that gives you six notes per octave. And that sounds like this. Sorry. And how many different ways can I choose three of those four things? The answer is four, and it sounds like this. And notice that four choose three is the inverse of four choose one. But four choose two is some unholy deeper dimension of it. <laughs> um, so 
and so on and so forth. So you can build more and more complex uh, structures as you go deeper. So how, what happens when I do five, choose one? I've introduced a new harmonic 11. So I have one, three, five, seven, 11. So what's that sound like? And it's inverse five, choose four. Um, so five choose one, five choose four, those all have five notes per octave. If I do five choose two or five choose three, these have 10 notes per octave. So things start getting dense. Uh, so you have to really start plucking notes out of it to make it sound good, but I'll just spam the keyboard right now. And it's inverse. Um, more on that. Uh, this is going to be more awesome than it might sound right this second as I get to the next one. Uh, and then finally, just to close this off, uh, let's six, six choose one. Now I've added a 13 in there. Now what happens if I do six choose three? That's 20 notes per octave. What are you supposed to do with that? It's 20 notes per octave. It's a lot, right? So uh, that's what's going to come next. But anyways, those uh, geometries that you saw were um, from this paper. So uh, I showed you the 4, 1, 4, 2, uh, 4, 3. Um, this is the, come on. Ah. This is uh, everything I just showed you, basically. Um, so these are actually rows in Pascal's triangle. So this bottom row here is the 6. So Six choose zero is nothing. Six choose one, I just played for you. Six choose five is its inverse. Six choose two is a pentadecany. It's 15 notes per octave. Uh, six choose four is its inverse, also 15 notes per octave. And then finally, the icosny, which is six choose three. Uh, Irv actually went to eight, ebdomicontiny. Um, that's beyond the limitations of uh, plugins. So I, I, I just went to six. Um, okay. Let's move on to the next one. I'll show you how you can um, how you can navigate those super dense structures because they're incredibly symmetric and they, and they uh, they're profoundly musically useful. Uh, so what I'm going to introduce now is this idea of what we call Euler genus six. So what's that mean? Uh, Euler genus six means uh, all of the geometry. For row six of Pascal's triangle, six one, six two, six three, six three, but also all of the subsets of all of those pieces of geometry and all of their subsets and their subsets. So, one of the things about Pascal's triangle is it's built up, uh, right? It, it's something you start you start with ones in the in the diagonals and you add uh, the next row. So, you start with zero zero. Uh, you you know you you add those together. Then you get uh, a choose two two choose one. Then when you add a, a one and a two, you get the three. Well, this, this three one has inside of it three two choose ones. That, that's what no one tells you about Pascal's triangle. <laughs> Every element contains all of the, the elements before it. It's, it's an additive uh, construct. So this can make it very useful to navigate um, this really dense space. So let's go to... This next guy. So Euler genus six. Now back out. So this is uh, Euler genus six. So this is that row I just showed you, and uh, these are all being selected in real time. If you look at the keyboard down there, um, and this is the icosany. Now I can drill into this icosany, and let's go back to this uh, paper here. So what what makes an icosany? The icosany was made up by summing all of uh, a bunch of decanies. That may not be obvious there but here here they are whoops <laughs> i get my here so drilling you can drill into this geometry so inside this decany i'm sorry icosany the inside the six choose three are six decanies and six inverse decanies so the these are the five choose two that you saw on there so then when you look at that static drawing you don't realize that inside there is a, an explosion of uh, subsets so when i select one of these decanies what happens to this drawing on the left the drawing on the left is showing you these are the 10 notes of that decany and when i select a different decany 
these are the 10 notes. So when I say subsets, what I mean is everything I'm showing you is one of those 20 notes from the icosany. It's just selected out. It's kind of like playing the, you know, uh, Dorian on a 12 ET keyboard, right? You're, you're picking out seven notes out of the 12, but you're the poor guy who has to filter those out in your mind. Here, I'm doing it for you. All you have to do is you don't have to finger this. You just hover your mouse over it and it selects a different one. And notice that very interesting rotation in there. So the other thing that's interesting here is these are complementary. So this five choose two is the opposite of five choose three. And you can see that uh, when I hop back and forth here, they, this is 10 notes of the icosmy. This is the other 10. They're, they're, they don't include each other. Um, notice what's happening too. Every brightly colored note on this page is a subset of whatever it is you have selected. So I selected this decany. That means that in this guy here, these four notes are also in that decany. So this allows you to do things like common tone modulation. So I can play this decany, and if I want to go to a different decany, I can target those four notes that are in that decany that I want to go to, play those in my current decany, and then swap out to the new decany and start playing it. So uh, this is how you do. So basically, two powerful ideas here. One is inverses. I can jump back and forth between inverses for contrast and common tone modulation. I can jump from one piece of geometry to another. Uh, and those are super powerful musical ideas. And of course, th this is blows my mind. It keeps going. So I can drill into this one decany and guess what's inside it? It has five tetranies and five hexanies. And guess what? <laughs> you can drill into those. What's inside that hexany? Um, it's a whole bunch of triads. It's eight of them. And every single note you're seeing is all part of that 20 notes uh, from the top, the icosmy. We're drilling into the icosmy. We're going into this really deep space. Um, so I'll uh, play some. I'll play some notes. I'll just I'll just play some like arpeggios. Um. So many different moods inside this thing. When I played that 20 note an octave thing, it sounded awful. It was just dense. It's just, you know, what do I do with this thing? Look at all that emotional like treasure that's buried inside it. It's just uh, absolutely mind blowing. And phenomenal. Is that the same fingering <laughs> for all of us? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that's what's so cool. Um, as I, the keyboard's retuned. If you look at the bottom here, this guy. Uh, it's retuned as I as I select scales. So, you know, and look, you're seeing all these proportional triads too. Right, this is what we started with, right? <laughs> Anyways, you get the idea. So what I like to do is, uh, you know, playing around with these seeds. Like I, I made, I made these seeds uh, one, three, five, seven, seventeen, forty-five, um, and then I go look through this enormous structure, find the cool ones that sound good to me, and then I save them as automation. And then you can just think of them as uh, chord progressions or whatever you want. So, anyways, that's Euler genus. Ooh, how am I doing on time? 924. All right, let's keep going. Um, is it okay if I just uh, ask you if you've ever contemplated a hemisphericity model? You know, when you have like the 20 notes and you can show the inverse, it's like one side and then another subset is the complete opposite side. 
And then, you know, you see these brain models where, you know, whatever functions are happening for the human physiognomy, it lights up. You know, they always talk about it lighting up in different parts of the brain and different parts of the brain working together for different things. Have you ever used any of that as a model? Um, I haven't. I, I was thinking that's, this, that's such a great question, too. It's very thought provoking. What I showed you, you know, you, those papers, you know, uh, Earth projected this geometry down on paper, but what if we showed it in 3D in virtual reality? Like, I don't know how you'd play that, but when, when, when you asked, I don't even know how to say hemispherosity, but uh, <laughs> when, when you said that, that was the first thing I thought of was like, that'd be another way of exploring how these things are all connected. Uh, but it certainly tickles my brain, that's for sure. Um, didn't, didn't Craig do a little bit of research at that with that your guy Juno Kim? They, yeah. they were actually working with 3D spaces with goggles to where you could walk to these different parts of the geometry and trigger the notes through your your movements. Yeah, we. I need to follow up. With that that I, would be I, a great way to, to to visualize the uh, hemisphere like nature of it because you could get fairly complex if you're standing within it, a shell basically. Uh, yeah, we need to follow up with him. I, I don't. Yeah, he, he got started on that, and I haven't seen an update. Yeah, yeah, I haven't heard an update either. Mm. The uh, the application I'm thinking of is that um, so much of what Irv Wilson does is in creating scales that then can be explored to be music. Would be you know, and and certainly the functionality of of Wilsonics being so uh, impressively open to what you can do with it. I'm just thinking so much of what you've been doing personally is found object. Like, let's see what this sounds like. And then, you know, you have these emotional uh, designations for what you hear. This is beautiful. This is ugly. This is, you know, which might be very personal to you and not shared always by everyone. Yeah. Though it seems Stephen does agree with you most of the time. <laughs> uh, I'm just thinking, though, if you actually just figure out a context where the brain lights going off are then directly related to the actual pitches. Like if you have 20 and it's 10 and 10, um, you could then say, okay, the first 20 primary points that go off in the brain would sound like this. You're talking about like a mapping function? Yeah. Where you're basically mapping a pitch space to a, a physiological space. Another way to, to get surprise in how things are harmonized. Hmm. Because, you know, the 20 together is the two together, just like the two hemispheres working together. It's all one brain. So you're, you're starting with that anyway. Yeah, there's a there's a composer up in Northern California. I don't know if he's still up there named Richard Warp, who has done a lot of work with um, putting sensors on the brain. His wife's, a, I think, a neurologist uh, and uh, and having your thoughts basically map to different either pitch parameters or tone parameters. I mean, it's kind of arbitrary at a point. It's like, what are you going to map those brain impulses to? To, to, to scalar scale data, to volume data. Um, well, it, it, yeah, I was just thinking if the 20, that specific 20 was- And you give them a location, thing, right? Yeah, it would uh, just uh, create a plastic sound for brain function, mm -hmm. which could be helpful, uh, even for it, medicinal purposes. Right, it would definitely be re revelatory. Right, it must be, uh, you know, besides the issues of whether you like it or not. Yeah, uh, we should explore this more. Yeah. Um, definitely um, getting uh, brain mapping vibes uh, off of this. All right, uh, I see I'm, I'm running out of time here. I'm going to just fast forward over this one. This is recurrence relation. Uh, again, uh, Irv really uh, optimized for some a difference tone. Uh, this is creating a scale explicitly through some tones. So this is where you take, uh, you, you say, I'm going to have a sequence of numbers. I'm going to start with two seeds and uh, the, the, and I'm going to build a scale from that. So for example, uh, if seed zero is one and seed one is one, one plus one is two. 
And then uh, if you say the next one is the sum of the previous two, uh, two plus one is three, and then so on and so forth. So this is exactly, you know, this is the Fibonacci sequence, but they could be generalized. You don't have to just do the sum uh, of what came before you. You can also do, you could say, oops, sorry, this is the canonical Fibonacci sequence right here. Um, and I can reseed it. So this is the same. I don't think I'm explaining this very well because I'm uh, kind of rushing, but uh, the idea is I'm changing the initial conditions and I'm getting a different <clears throat> uh, different emotional palette here, but I'm, I'm constructing the scale the same way. So eventually the further out I go, uh, the more it converges to be like a moment of symmetry. Mm -hmm. But changing those initial conditions uh, uh, can color the scale like to your way. Uh, so again, I'm kind of rushing this one. This is really fun. I've uh, found a few of these that just uh, just tickle my brain like in all the right ways. So uh, really fun to explore. All right, so that's recurrence relations. Sorry, I'm kind of going fast there. Oh, and then finally, uh, the last thing I wanted to show you is as you're exploring and you find something cool, like, oh, I love this one. Uh, sorry. There's a feature I just call favorites. This was in the iOS app. You can add your scale as a favorite. So now this recurrence relation is here and I can recall it. So these are some other ones that I oops, had made. Did not, are you not doing that? There we go. So these are some of the favorites that I have already. Um, they're automatable. So you can start curating your own favorites and you think of them as like a bookmark to go get back to it. it takes you right back to that page where you, where, you, where you were when you created that scale. So that's favorites. And that is it. Uh, like I said, um, oh, this is uh, the software is available for, it's in public beta now. Uh, so um, I have a website that I, I shared. Um, uh, Vitor, maybe you can help me share in the chat. I don't see my chat button, so. Yeah, I, I sent the presentation out uh, in the thank chat, you. so yeah, it's thank out you. there. I can so, send it again. Thank you so much, Vitor. Uh, yeah, I can't see the chat when I'm presenting my screen. Um, yeah, so uh, I have a website. It's uh, plugins available for download. Uh, it's only supported for Mac right now. I'll get to Windows probably early next year. Um, and uh, it's it's beta, so bear with me. Uh, there's, it's missing some things. Uh, probably you're, you're going to find bugs and stuff, but that's uh, part of the process. Uh, but uh, yeah, I have a, a, a special Wilsonic Discord just to support folks as they uh, try and set up uh, the plugin on their platform. So, so <laughs> where where do we go to get this? Um, I have a website. Um, Wilsonic.co. Someone stole com. I'm so mad. Uh, uh, yeah, I think I see. I see Vito typing. <laughs> yeah, I will send it in the chat. <laughs> okay, thanks. Sorry. Um, cool. Uh, any questions? I'm not. How much time do we have for questions? All right. Well, you were very informing, so it's hard to ask for a question. <laughs> well, uh, thanks so much. It's, it's such a pleasure uh, being here. I love sharing this stuff with y'all. Um, one of my favorite things about sharing with you guys is y'all know what this is, <laughs> what it's about, the context. When I share it with other folks, they're like, I don't understand what you're talking about. Why are you doing this? Um, so, I'm, so, so Mar Marcus, one question has to do with like collaboration. So if you're working with someone else in a different DAW, is there a way to uh, have settings maintain consistency? I said, hey, I want to send you this track, lay something on top of it. And in it, I have a master and client that's got all these uh, tuning progressions, right? Going from one tuning system to another, every bar or whatever. Can I, is there a way we could collaborate uh, in a situation like that without having to have the identical DIW? Ooh. Uh... That's advanced. But now, if uh, if you and I both agreed to have the same software synthesizers on our two separate systems, we could uh -huh. share, share like Ableton files 
and, and that in fact there's a whole industry on that right like that pre, you know presets and producer packs right they can work that way but if we're we have different uh daws i don't i'd have to work on that i don't know how okay. that, i'm not sure what the file would be like a, a like a like i could send you a contact preset with the samples mm -hmm. and then it's okay bring that up and it'll be the exact same thing i have is there a way to bring up a little sonic file like a but but not but it would have to be linked to a timeline somehow so mm. uh yeah i don't have anything like support for anything like that right now uh, yeah. i am adding scala file support i forgot to mention that uh, at least and, like a MIDI file should be fine because you know it triggers the, the software so then if you have the same preset the same scale and the same MIDI file I guess you can get the same thing that's a that's a good end. test I should test should that test, we should try that yeah yeah yeah, it, uh, yeah it's, we need to make sure the automation can be exported that's that's the right key. right yeah, because that's some, some software is. allows for that at some you know, you know doesn't so it's worth trying because I know that Ableton wasn't able, uh, like the media files you, uh, you could do were only one channel, so you yeah. couldn't do like sixteen MIDI channels at the same time or or whatever. No, oh. do other DAWs do that with the MTS? No. Uh, uh, the MTS, uh, some I think do. Hmm. Uh, this is a good question for uh, Odd Sound. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, on the note of uh, Scala files, I'm also going to support key keyboard mappings. So that way, you know, the, the two, the .sel file and the .kbm file together, so that it will literally be exactly what you heard in Will Sonic, right? So the root note and the mapping, everything stays the same. If you just, well, that's good. If you just share the Scala file by itself without the keyboard mapping, then you get normalized to middle C and no. it won't be the exact same frequencies, right? Yeah, it can get complicated. It's the same proportions, but not the same root note. So. The, the keyboard mapping helps solve for that. So uh, that I'm actually working on that now. I'm just not ready to demo it. So. Just just a question about the the programming. How how are you actually getting around the the um, you know with the MIDI um, numbers? Are you using MIDI tuning standard with the with the pitch bend? Yeah, uh, it's polyphonic and, pitch bend. Yeah. And are you changing channel each time, or 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 uh, or will the pitch bend wind up being applied to to? Uh, it's complicated. Um, you know, if you if you change note suddenly, will the pitch bend still stay there, or is it actually changing channel each time? So that's a great question. Uh, some and okay, it it depends on on how the software synthesizer manufactured it. On the on the question of uh, as you're changing your global tuning table, does does the synth update in real time? Uh, the the answer is mostly yes. Um, on the question of are you are you managing uh, like a, a MIDI track per note? Uh, that's um, that depends on your sequencer and your software synthesizer choice. So many of these uh, software synthesizers that I showed here, uh, they actually communicate directly with the master, and they don't even go through the, the sequencer like the the MIDI channels or anything. There, there's only one MIDI channel. It's all polyphonic uh, pitch bin under the hood. So that that's the best level of support here. When you some software synthesizers don't do that, like this surge example, and so I need this extra plugin. This this is a Max for Live patch that will go listen to the master and do ex exactly what you said under the hood. Have uh, a number of MIDI tracks per note, um, but but you don't have to manage that. Okay, but but in that case, if if you if you make a MIDI file of what you're playing with the Wilsonic app. That that should be a, a, exportable to another DAW, I, I would assume. Oops, what happened here? Um, I think so. We should test that. Um, okay. Yeah. Yeah. That that would be that would be interesting. Um, and you said the code is on uh, GitHub. It, is that? Can we download the? Uh, the it's a, it's or... the, that was the code for Audio Kit Synth One. Uh, that was an okay. open source project. Uh, and so that code's there. Well, Sonic is not, um, it's, it's a private repo. It, it's not uh, okay, open it's source not. yet. Okay. Yeah, I'm, uh, here's the thing. Uh, I've worked on a lot of open source projects. It's a pain in the ass. <laughs> mm, yeah, no, I imagine to have other people <laughs> con contributing, yeah, yeah. Yeah, is I any, mean, it, is it, it takes a special collaboration for it to really work, right? Not just anyone can walk in and contribute. You know? And change stuff, yeah. 
Is it is it coded in C plus plus or in? Yeah, yeah. it's ju it's okay. juice. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, yeah. Looks, so I'm, I'm it hoping like this, I hope it just works on uh, Windows. That's my hope. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you very much. Oh, appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's, it looks looks. I'm I'm looking forward to uh, downloading it. Great. So. Uh, yeah, just jump uh, in in the I have, I have a Wilsonic Discord. You can DM me and I'll show you how to join it. And I can support yeah. you as you try and uh, uh, play with it. Yeah. Thank you. OK, so I'm going to stop the recording for right now. We can keep talking. Uh, but uh, just give me a moment, please. <laughs>